Hello and very warm welcome to my students and to my audience worldwide. Uh, this is again Professor Dr. Zia Ahmed recording a very short video uh, on uh, Ahmed Ali's novel Twilight in Delhi part two. Uh, I think my audience may be remembering right now that already some videos have been captured on its introduction and on different chapters of part one and today we are on part two. For the benefit of my students, I need to revise first of all a few sentences here that this is the story of uh, Mughal Delhi, how it underwent in first of all into twilight and after that 100% change from Delhi to Delhi. Uh, this change goes to suggest once again that uh, uh, there was the British government, they uh, had occupied this Delhi and now it was converting into a colonized country. And in the backdrop of that whole system, everything was going on. And in this regard, we were having a big witness of the Mughal culture uh, that we found in the first part of this book. Meer Nihal, his wife, Begum Meer Nihal. And after that, there was the other characters. But alongside that, we had a understanding. We had an understanding of the character of Askar also, who was a prototype of a modern generation under the colonial system. And uh, altogether, the novel in the first part has been proving that it's a romantic story, a love story of Asghar as well, not only Asghar, but that of his father also, along with many other characters. So lots of things have been found out about the Muslim, Muslim Mughal culture, along with the condition of the women. In part two of this book, the writer is bringing us forward to the stage when everything is colonizing, everything is under the colonizer, and uh, the king possibly, uh, English king possibly may be having a visit. And that is why in the backdrop of Mughal culture, we are going to study those chapters now. Uh, very selected chunks of the text will be studied in order to find out how colonialism was affecting, influencing, and changing and intervening into the local Mughal culture. So let me take you to the second part of the novel. And uh, let's see what we can see there. Uh, this is the part two in its beginning with the uh, is, is it a storm or is it life? We die of living and the strife. So this is the type of things that we shall be having. And uh, in order to take you to the text of the first chapter of part two, we are here. This is the first chapter of part two. And number of things will be repeated in the same way as it has been repeated. But if you can see here in the line number five and four and six, there's a significant thing being talked about, for example, Begum Nihal said she had never experienced such a summer ever since 1857, the year of mutiny. So that goes to remind the year of mutiny, 1857. That was the termination of the Mughal rule altogether. And ultimately, Muslim witnessed that they were no more the rulers. And uh, it was the English government which had come. 1857 is being termed here as mutiny, uh, which was mostly called by the Muslims as... Uh, Azadi, but it is called by the British as the colonizer as mutiny. So that is the difference of understanding and that's the difference of the textual references. Ahmed Ali is calling it mutiny uh, in, in line with the writers of the British colonialism or the post-colonial writers he's, he's trying to do so. And therefore, this is the kind of thing that we should keep in our mind when we discuss the paragraphs here. So uh, that's the situation then uh, since 1857, the thing is being repeated from 1857 onward. And now we have to see what things can be offered here uh, as, as the proof of all this thing, which, which is the backdrop, which is the kind of situation in which we are living. So first of all, this is the heat that the writer would like to talk about in order to set the stage. For example, the writer says, the sky lost its color and became dirty and bronzed. The loo did not stop even at night. The stars flickered in the sky behind the covering layer of dust. The sand rained down all night, came between the teeth, covered the beds, and sleep did not come near past humanity. Uh, tempers rose and from all around came the loud voices of women curling husbands, beating their wives, mothers, their children, and there seemed to rest, seem no rest for men. Fires broke out every uh, now and then. Uh, at such times, the sky was made red with the flames that shot up from the burning earth. Men died of sunstroke and even birds were not immune from the destructive influence of the sun and many pigeons died. What a beautiful paragraph because here number of things have been said in just few lines. For example, first of all, the difference between the West and the East is being highlighted that East is 
having lot of heat or hot summer season and then if the hot summer season is there definitely uneasiness is there uncomfortableness is there then the dust is there all these things do not appear to have their place in the western societies so as a binary opposition if we have have here the bad condition weather condition of summer season it is quite the opposite and here the the kind of uh, intensiveness can be felt that the sand would enter into the beds also into the teeth also in that way the poor condition of the weather was there in such a situation sentimentality rose very high because we are being told that women would start fighting with each other and the husband could beat them again repeating one of the claims made by the european scholars as, as discussed in orientalism by edward said same was the ca case with the burning of the earth or the heat of the earth and then uh, pigeons death also so in this way the deaths are taking place the girls are there sentimentality is there and all is being uh, highlighted in a very different way in order to let us know that that was the difference that was the problem with the east and that was the difference from the west as well going further and trying to locate more things here for example this is the paragraph on page 90 it says outside the city beyond the fort and beyond the mori gate workmen were digging away in the scorching heat of may leveling or raising the earth beautifying ground and preparation for the coronation of a new and foreign king but that was still far off and no one seemed to be concerned uh, so this is the point from where the entry of the british colonizer would be there that the local people are digging the earth leveling the earth and raising somewhere and somewhere subduing the earth and preparing the beautiful places so that they could welcome the English king, whenever he visits, the coronation may take place. So that is the arrival of the English king. That is the occupation of the English people of India that is being hinted at here that ultimately the king is going to visit. In comparison to the English, uh, to the to the Mughal kings here, this is the new king which is coming from England and that is why a contrastive uh, presence of the king will be discussed here and the contrastive culture will be talked about and the hint will be given that the India of that time where twilight is being referred to was being done because the, the kind of thing was happening that the British colonizer king was coming and his colonial system had already established itself. Going with the same tone, inside the city went do free through the length and breadth of Chandni Chowk, raised dust in the streets and Violins lashed the stalwart trees that stood in the rows in the middle of the bazaar. From Fatehpuri to Fountain and beyond, men shut themselves up inside the houses or in shops at noon the city seemed deserted and dead but for the grating noise of tram cars that plied throughout the day, though very few people used them. So here is again the intensity being shown that the heat was there but in that intervention of the new things has been talked about that not only the coronation of the king is going to take place coronation means Taj Poshi but also the tram cars were entering into the city and that was the new entry because of the British colonization so hints are being given that the British were present and they were introducing themselves through different means and techniques also so in that way the chapter is going to highlight the situation where Delhi culture is going to die out under the influence of the powerful culture of the British people. A few lines to remind us where we are and what type of culture we had in our background. The writer says that he would have liked to go home via Babal Jans for she had been ill, but his pigeon worried him so he came straight down Chandni Chowk towards the clock tower to go through the Bali Maran, the nearest way home, as he, next page, uh, as he passed the clock tower, he saw a number of camel carts uh, wind their way, creaking, groaning, moving slowly, etc., etc. In the same way, a little bit down if we go, there was an aroma of the camphor in the air and for some unknown reason, he began to think of Babanjan. Her thought was sad and sweet like the memory of some dear one dead coming from somewhere far from away, ripping upon the waves of unconscious, saddening the heart. A wave of self-pity surged in his breast. He felt he... Uh, was getting old, he was 62, he tried to suppress the feeling but a particular heaviness appeared in his uh, head, a pressure of blood from which he wants to burst out of its restricting channels of veins and arteries. For a moment everything went black in front of his eyes, he thought it was the result of his constipation or was it heat stroke, this seemed more plausible to Mir Nihal. And here therefore Baban Jan is being reminded to us again and all these things will continue to be discussed with reference to Baban Jan ultimately the uh, hero, the protagonist, Meer Nihal, would reach our house and he would find that uh, uh, this woman, Baban Jan, is really ill and sick and he's possibly going to die as well. So what we can do with such paragraphs is to uh, let us remind once again uh, that 
the twilight in Delhi means actually disappearing of the Muslim Mughal culture and entry of the British culture and government and power as well. And here also when we see that the pigeons are dying, when we see that Baban John is dying, it means that the happiness which Mir Nihal would enjoy because of these two things that is going to disappear. And that happiness which was the part and parcel of the life of Mir Nihal is disappearing. It can be analogized with the disappearance of happiness of Muslims because of the absence of their own government. So last remnants of their governments were disappearing. Last remnants of the happiness of the Muslim culture was disappearing. It was only the thing which was coming was the sadness for the Muslim people. Same is happening with Mir Nihal, his beloved. Uh, Baban Jan is ill. He wants to see her. He is concerned about his uh, pigeons as well. So it may be apparently just a woman who is going to die from the life of Mir Nihal. It may be just a pigeon who is going to die. But actually it means that the happiness, sources of happiness for Mir Nihal are disappearing. As Mir Nihal is the representative of the Mughal culture, uh, of the thriving, prospering and a very, you know, luxurious type of exotic culture, Eastern culture, but that is going to die, that is going to finish, that is at the last moment taking the last breaths in shape, the shape of pigeon, the shape of Baba Jan, in the shape of happiness of Mir Nihal. So this is what is happening and that is why the title of the novel is going to be Twilight in Delhi. Let us go and see more text available here in order to find out what the text can say to us, tell us. Uh, we shall be continuing with many other things that are going on. Here is a proposal that I shall not be discussing. This proposal is far as a fool that he may be having a marriage with someone's daughter. That's not important to read. So that's why I'm skipping. And here coming to the chapter two of part two. This chapter two again is about the heat that is here and there. And everywhere the heat is present. So the hot summer season is the main stage where the things are being set in chapter three. Of course, we may be finding some of the paragraphs which are important. Uh, there is a Hakeem mentioned here that is Hakeem Fure Khan that is important again in order to provide medicine and other things. The Masrur is also again repeated here. Masrur, the boy which was repeated to have uh, going to school and uh, living a life of an orphan and was not happy at all. In the same way, the things continue to go on down the lane of this chapter also. Nothing important is here that may be talked about and discussed. So that is why this may be ignored. And in that way, let us reach to the next one in order to find something which may be of uh, use for us to discuss in the backdrop of colonialism, in the backdrop of Mir Nihal's twilight in Delhi, in the backdrop of those things which are happening and definitely finish. So that is why it will be very advisable to see what is in the ending uh, paragraph uh, so that we can start the third chapter with an entire different view. Uh, like if you see here, the ending of the uh, third chapter, it is having, uh, you know, very different ending. Let me take you to the ending of the chapter three. Uh, it, it is on this page. This is the ending. For hours, Mir Nihal had, uh, had uh, premonitions of death and it, at this news he missed it. Heartbeat, intuitively he felt that the worst had come and with this thought, the earth seemed to slip from under his feet. He went downstairs hurriedly, forgetting to close the door of the loft and went to Baban Jan. So Mir Nihal is given the intimation that Baban Jan is dead and in that way, that source of happiness, that source of representation of Mughal culture, right or wrong, good or bad, that has finished at the end of the uh, second chapter. The third chapter uh, begins with the same tone and that is why the poet has included some lines of poetry. We, these lines are showing us the helpless of the helplessness of the poet and that of loneliness, for example, has been shown here. And this is exactly in uh, correspondence with the condition of Mir Nihal that after the death of uh, Baban Jan, his condition is like that. Uh, well, uh, we need to talk further about these lines. For example, uh, Mir Nihal's uh, condition uh, may be uh, not so much visible here and there, but on his face, in his mind, this condition is always available. Uh, for example, Mir Nihal says, Mir Nihal heard it and he was filled with anxiety as he thought that she might die. Who would care for him when she had gone? His wife was there, no doubt, and to, and so were the children. But the word they lived in was a domestic word. There was no beauty in it and no love. Here at Babanjan's, he had built a quiet corner for himself where he could always retire and forget his sorrows in its secluded peace. It was 
now over five years that he had kept her as his mistress and a bond of love had grown between them. He felt it more deeply perhaps because he was old, conscious of the length, lengthened shadow of life. So this is the repetition of the uh, Bourbon John's relationship with Meer Nihal. So we are not uh, spending our time on it. We know it very well that Bourbon John was very important in the life of Meer Nihal and know when she was about to die at that time, uh, uh, he was feeling very sad. For example, here, Meer Nihal went towards the veranda in which Baba John lay on a bed covered from head to foot with a sheet. He took up the lantern and covered her face. Even in death, she looked beautiful. Even death had not taken, death had not taken away the charm from her face. Her eyebrows were arched and her lips were uh, gently closed as in the wayward smile and uh, her eyes seemed to be closed in sleep. So that is the way how we praise our dead ones that Baba John is dead, but the, the face appeared very beautiful. Um, Meer Nihal also sat down. He had certainly become weak and old and there seemed no strength in his limbs. He sat there for some time, lost in a world of memories and regrets. So as I already said that the death of Baban John in fact means the death of that government, that Mughal culture, Muslim culture, with which Delhi was famous, that, has, that is disappearing altogether. And Meer Nihal therefore weeks, uh, feels himself very much weak, very much lost and in very much regret. So definitely this is going to be the condition of the Muslim Mughal culture after it was disappearing. So going down with the same tone, uh, another thing happens that the uh, pigeon of Meer Nihal also die. So death of uh, Baban Jan is symbolic of the death of Muslim culture as the, as the death of the pigeon is also that of the symbolic of the death of the culture of the Muslim people. The cats definitely uh, could be the source of death the uh, snakes could be the source of death, but in both, both cases, whatever is happening, death is taking place and this death is the death of the representation or the symbols of the Muslim culture. Uh, like Mir Nihal's condition may be found out in certain lines, for example, he did not give much out of his share to Begum Nihal except a little for extra expenses. The rent from the houses and the land was enough to keep him clothed and fed. Most of his business was his own and was spent on running the establishment of Baba Jan. Now she was dead and he, he didn't care what mattered if it, he was dependent on his sons or anybody else and he decided to give up his work. So Meer Nihal totally retires after the death of Baba Jan. See that chapter four is beginning now. Dil Chan, with Dil Chan, the maid servant, the chapter begins and here is the paragraph that may be considered of some importance. When he was taking his food, the thought of Baba Jan and his grief filled his mind. He thought of his callousness and the indifference of the world. There she was dead beneath the all embracing earth and he was taking his food, enjoying himself already under the earth. The worms must have set up upon her lovely body. Already she was in the hands of the land of dead and here he was thinking of other things of others and lesser sorrows than her death. As he thought of this, the food stuck in his throat. Tears rushed to his eyes and he looked away outside the wind blew dragging along the floor of the courtyard carrying with it bits of paper, dry leaves and twigs of the Hina tree. So this is the condition in which Meer Nihal right now is present. Uh, though Baban Chan was a woman and we don't have a very, you know, favorable kind of opinion about her, we are saying that she was a keep and she was prostitute, but still you see how deep influence she had on the mind of Meer Nihal that after her death, he's feeling so sad and upset. Uh, this is the similar kind of sadness and upsetness when uh, King Lear had sent his daughter Cordelia out and after that he was so sad and upset. It's also similar to Chinva Achebe's hero, Akankwo, that when he had kill, uh, killed uh, with his own hands, when he had killed Ikmi Fiona, whom he loved so much, uh, after that he was so sad. So love is love all the time, but this love is uh, a little bit different from the love of those novels I, and dramas I refer to. Here one love is breathing new, that is the love of Asgar and Bilkis, another love is dying. So one generation is finishing, the new generation is coming up, but love will survive in one way or the other. That is what the point is going to be. So let us go further and see what more we can read about this. Um, here is a little bit of the paragraphs which goes to show that wife is also important, but not that important as Baban Jan was important. For example, Begum Nihal who sat opposite looked at his face, it was drawn out and pale and there was a look of sadness in his eye. She thought that it was the death of his pigeon which had affected him so deeply. Uh, he was very fond 
he was very fond of uh, them and they had often so uh, maybe mrs meer nihar is unable to understand what's the real cause uh, of the grief of sadness she thought that it's possibly the death of the pigeon but actually it was babanjan so love has affected in such a way as the indian song goes tere bina bhi kya jeena so that's the time of the type of thing happening with meer nihar after the death of uh, this uh, this uh, this this woman with whom he was so much attached again let's have uh, a little bit of thing with respect to the culture apre uh, to his own thoughts lost in his fidelity he reached the house of nawab but some people were sitting there and among them nawab sirajuddin khan sial rather sail sail the poet wearing his four cornered cap his well starched and fine clothes and impressive flowing beard a discussion was going on regarding the merits of zauk and dag and poets so that paragraph again reminds us about the culture of the mughal delhi that poets were very much important in that culture and the importance of these poets can be understood in the sense also that they were discussed their, their poetry was discussed by the people who were cultured and civilized and many a time long long debates were held and so it's a reminder of the culture which was possibly present but now it was disappearing so let us see more about this disappearance how it was going on for this purpose let's go deep into the text more chapters may be considered of this part for example in this chapter we have this very small paragraph which says they were silent for a while looking back into the past somewhere in the lane a child was crying pathetically and a man was shouting at the child the world is a house of many mirrors wherever you turn you see your own image in the glass the multiply and become immunable until you begin to feel frightened of your own self to meer nihal it seemed that it was not a child but he himself was crying and a peculiar feeling of anxiety almost taken to sadness took possession of him he did not know so that again and again is being said how sad he was and even the crying of the child is being related to him but beautiful line is that the world is a house of many mirrors that is what we see ourselves in the sad things crying of women and children when we are sad and when we are happy we see ourselves in the happy things so it's all up to you as chinu hb says in his book uh, things fall apart the novel he says that every man has got a chi chi is a god every man has got a chi and if your chi is happy you are happy if she is not happy you are not happy so in that way the condition of the men and human being is being pointed out with reference to their happiness and externalization is being given in the shape of sadness so spread around meer nihal so that we may be able to understand how much meer nihal was sad his sadness continues to be there and he continues to talk of the death of uh, in death of babanjan in such a way that we can conclude that death of babanjan killed meer nihal altogether all his spirit all his strength all his happiness was gone so let's see in uh, chapter 5 uh, some of the fakirs have been talked about which were also the important part of the muslim culture that one of them is meer sangi students can read the details of these fakirs one is uh, red beard that is again another fakir any another darwesh then is molvi dulhan another one uh, there is the fakir and darwesh also so fakirs and darwesh used to be an important part of the mogal culture of delhi in that way uh, they are being refer- referred to here for example here on this page uh, 125 also we have the story of kambal shah so in that way number of fakirs will be talked about and, the, and just to have a view of that you people can make a reading of these lines where these fakirs are discussed there is no more uh, need of reading in detail uh, in the lecture they can be understood separately at your homes as well so in that way we are on chapter 6 that chapter 6 also carries some of the points for us possibly important with reference to the idea of colonization death of uh, meer nihal sculpture and the symbols of the mogal culture this small paragraph let's have a type of reading to find out and take us back once again to the colonial culture that was taking place for example the writer says to children he was a constant reminder of coming eid and the elders too were pleased as shah maqbool arrived they all began to look forward to eid which was not far away nor was a swift marriage it had originally been fixed for the month of eid but had to be postponed till december as meer nihal the son could not get long leave they were busy making preparations for the coronation of george v which was to take place in december and they had to send things and men for the uh, event from their various districts to delhi so uh, here is once again the reminder of the colonial system which had taken place and because of its presence number of things can happen for example in order to prepare for the coronation of the english king into into delhi 
the uh, marriage function of uh, uh, of Asghar was to be postponed because that was more important. So now the importance of uh, arrival of the British king is, uh, is 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 there. That is more important as compared to Asghar's marriage. So in that way, local culture and local people have become less important as compared to the uh, arrival and intervention of the new culture. So it reminds us the colonization that has taken place, and because of that, number of changes are coming into the lives of the people. Let's go more and see what we can have in this chapter and after that in order to keep on working on this theme, on this idea that British culture was coming up. It was taking the grounds very deeply and it was shifting the already established norms of culture very rapidly, very fastly. The chapter is dedicated to that. So let us see what more we can have in chapter 7. Chapter 7 is again taking us and uh, going on between two lines. That is one line of the local Mughal culture. Other line is that of the English culture. That is why we see Tommies here in the market. We see the uh, in, in the bazaars and streets. We see the uniforms. We see the Englishmen. And we can see the arrival and presence of so many things which are British into the Mughal culture. So no, it was not simply possible to see the men and women which are wearing the dresses and culture of the Indian people, but it could be seen that there are many people who are British in style appearing here and there, their colors, their uniforms, their styles, their language, everything is appearing here and there in a very uh, deep way. There, there, there used to be the uh, processions with the, with the Muslim kings, but now the procession is that of the English king. There used to be the importance of the kings and princesses and princes also in that which has been going on, but now it is not the case at all. It is the uh, presence of the English people. So colonization is completing its round and that is why it brings us to 1911 Delhi in chapter 8, December 1911 Delhi. Let us see what we find here important with respect to Delhi of this time. It's a long paragraph that we uh, may read in detail, but a few of the lines I would like to discuss here that the king was to pass at certain places. So the gunmen and the uh, peons and the soldiers, they were present here in the shape of a crowd and everybody was witnessing how did the English look like. It was not possible for the people to try to find the difference between the one king and other people because every Englishman appeared in the same way. However, it 100% uh, contrasted with the appearance of the carriages of Rajas and Nawabs and these people were also accompanying the king and now they were behaving as if they were the slaves to this British king, British empire. So uh, as the people, some of the people, the important people who could have uh, won the freedom for India, they were now taking the part in the government of uh, British people and as a result they had also become the slaves to the empire and the empire was gaining its own so in that the colonial system was going on. A history uh, always is very important with respect to the colonization, what first of all it was and after that what happened. So that is why this passage would be important to make us understand what type of history existed on which the British colonial empire is being established. Right in front of him was the Red Fort built long ago by Shah Jahan, the greatest of artists in mortar and stone, but which was now being trampled by the ruthless feet of an alien race and this alien race is the British. On his right beyond the city wall was the Huni Darwaza, the bloody gate, and beyond that still was the old fort built by Feroz Shah. Tughlaq many more centuries ago, still beyond stretched the remnants of past Delhi's and of the ravished splendor of once mighty Hindustan. A, a, a Hamayun's tomb and Kutub Minar, there uh, it was that the Hindu king had built the newly early Delhi's, Hastinapur or Delhi, and, uh, and still in Mahroli stands the iron pillar as a memory of Ahsoka and other ruins of the day of Indian golden age and dynasty greater than history has ever known. Today it was this very Delhi which was being despoiled by a western race who had no sympathy with India or her sons thought me Nihal. Already they had put the iron chains of slavery round their once unbending necks. The horses pranced on the road as they walked and people gazed with curious eyes at the cottage as the cottage of native chiefs with its vain a glorious pomp and show and soldiers in armor and coats of mail and swords and lances, weapons useless in the face of guns, the processions passed by the Jame Masjid whose facade had been vulgarly decorated with the garland of golden writing containing slavish greetings from the Indian Muslims to the English king displaying the treasury of the priestly class to their people and Islam. This is very ironic paragraph and it is said that uh, because of such paragraphs 
uh, Ahmed Ali was arrested and put to jail also for writing such a novel. Uh, but it continued and persisted. Uh, the writer is telling us about the history of the Delhi, how it was established not only the Muslim kings established it, decorated it, but also the Hindu kings continued to work for this. So it means that this was the Delhi not only established by the Muslims, but also by the Hindus. And when it is conquered, it's not simply the Muslims which have been conquered, but also it is the Hindus. India actually has been conquered. So it should not be taken that it's only the Muslims which have been conquered. Alongside that, the writer also informed that the horses which used to carry the kings and princes of the Muslims with pomp and show, now it is, these are also carrying again, but they are carrying as a part of the British cavalcade. And it's also showing that these people have been decorating themselves. They have been decorating their ma mask as well as Jami Masjid is masked. It is just like the decoration of the death that is being uh, part of the removal actually. But the, when the death is even celebrated, it is like uh, making happiness over the death of something that the local uh, high class was also following the English king. So in that way, some of the conditions, the political condition of England of that time, of India of that time, of the people of India of that time have also been talked about by the writer. In fact, it has been the way of the British people that they would control some local populations and they would give them prizes and other things and as a result made them their company in order to win the whole country. Same thing was done here as there is a large number of people who belonged actually to the Muslims and Hindus, but they were now standing by the side of the uh, British people and so they were making their uh, uh, occupation of the country in a very facilitated way. So as a result, the representation of Mughal culture as Meer Nihal is, his condition is becoming absolutely bad. For example, he says here in this paragraph in the end of part two of this book, it was with a heavy heart that Meen Hall went home full of sense of futility and transience of the world. But great are the ravages of time and no one can do anything against his indomitable might. Kings die and dynasties fall, centuries and uh, centuries and centuries pass. But never a smile lights up the inscrutable face of time. Life goes on with a heartless continuity, trampling ideals and words under its ruthless feet, always in search of the new destroying building and demolishing once again with the meaningless petulance of the child who builds a house of sand only to raise it to the ground. Very pathetic and very touching paragraph it's going to be. And I would like to refer to this paragraph with respect to the uh, pharaohs of Egypt, for example, they were the people who constructed a big civilization, a huge civilization, but now uh, only the remains of that civilization is possible. Their civilization has disappeared. Pope, for example, in his book, Rape of the Lock, says that everything uh, is destroyed. Some things are destroyed with the wars, with the weapons of war, with the irons, and then if something survives, that is also destroyed by time. And same was the case with the poem of Shelley and Uzi Mendius that the king built a big statue of himself in order to survive in this world. But ultimately, the, the statue was broken, his head was lying somewhere else, legs were standing somewhere else. In this way, time is a very cruel kind of thing it destroys. And that also is a type of excuse being offered by us people that time has done this. No, it is the people also who have done this. Same has happened in India that time converted itself. First it were the Hindus who were the rulers of Delhi. Then it is the Muslims who were the rulers of Delhi. And ultimately it is the English people who are the rulers of Delhi. And so time is going on and time has said something. Time has done something. Mir Nihal is trying to show his condition with respect to time. But then we must analyze ourselves as well in order to see how much we are responsible. Have we played some part in it? If we have played, we need to make amends in our next coming life. So that is the analysis, textual analysis with reference to the post-colonial and colonial theory and the history of Pakistan and India. Uh, hopefully we shall be meeting in some other video, but right now it is quite sufficient to stop here. Uh, part two of the book has been analyzed. Hopefully we shall be seeing and meeting once again in part three of the book. Thank you for watching and if you have understood anything, if you have enjoyed anything, do not fail to hit the subscribe button and give your suggestions also, give your comments also in YouTube or Facebook so that I, I may be able to improve it further. Thank you very much. So nice of you.